must be destroyed on sight. Uh, welcome to They Must Be Destroyed on Sight, a movie podcast. Uh, I'm Lee Russell, and I'm here joined with uh, my friend and co-host, Daniel Harper. Say hello, Daniel. Hello, hello. How's it going? It's going good. Uh, we're going to be uh, doing uh, another horror movie this month. Um, good time to do it. And it is Ravenous from 1999, uh, directed by Antonia Bird, uh, written by Ted Griffin, and... Um, this is a rather uh, almost kind of a cult obscure movie in a way. Um, it, it's 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 definitely a movie that sort of flew under the radar when it was released, and is more of a cult movie at this point. Uh, it's set during the basically during the period of the um, uh, Mexican American War from uh, 1846 to 1848. Uh, I, I believe the movie is actually set in 1847. Um, and it, it basically revolves around uh, Guy Pierce's character, uh, uh, Captain Boyd, who uh, is a war hero, but a disgraced one at the same time, because uh, during a battle, uh, a critical battle in the war, um, he basically gives up. Uh, he shows cowardice on the field of battle, lays down and pretends to play dead, and a little while later when the Mexicans are carting off his body and the bodies of all of his uh, comrades, uh, he has a really unusual experience. He ends up drinking some of the blood of his comrades and... He, he is he is piled in... alive, piled yes. in a pile of bodies, believed dead, you know, so yeah. so he's just in the middle of a pile of bodies... And he says in flashback that he f- could feel the blood from like his commanding officer or whatever like flowing into his stomach. Yeah, like that's how. Um, j- just to kind of give you a feel for the level of uh, uh, rhetoric in this film. Yeah, the, the, um, the visceral details in this movie are, are quite are quite astonishing, actually. Um, so, so basically. Um, for some reason he can't explain, he manages to find the strength to essentially take the Mexican headquarters and win the battle. So he becomes a war hero, but everyone on his side knows that he was a, he was a coward. He admits he was a coward. And to, basically for propaganda reasons, they ship him the hell out of there as quick as possible to the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, And then the opening credits happen, Mm -hmm. by the way. Everything we've said so far is before the opening credits. Yeah, and and a funny thing is, like, originally when this movie was uh, constructed, uh, the opening battle scenes were supposed to be this uh, Saving Pryant Ryan Ryan, sort of opening battle that was supposed to be, you know, go for like 15 minutes or something like that, but they decided to cut it instead into flashbacks, which I think was probably a wise idea. Um, yeah, I don't know. This movie's already about an hour and 45, hour 50 minutes long, something, I don't know, you know, an extra 15 minutes. I don't know. I like the smaller scale of this movie. Yeah. Um, it's, one of the, it's one of its great pleasures is that it doesn't have like some huge action sequence um, mm. at the beginning. Anyway, please continue. I'm, I'm just commenting. Yeah, I'm interrupting. Fine. That's, that's what fine. I do. No, that's fine. Just butt, just butt in any time you feel like it, sir. Um, I will. I will. This is what I do. He's I a, do it on my own podcast. I do it on your podcast. Yeah. If, if you've never seen Daniel, he's a man with a beard. He's very aggressive. That's uh, is, is, is how it goes. Um, I'm a dick. Yeah. A giant dick. <laughs> but I don't eat people, and oh. that's where this movie is going. Yeah. So, uh, so Well, boy- sometimes I eat the ladies. <laughs> Actually, it's quite often, but you know. Yeah. So uh, I'm just trying to derail your conversation. That's all I'm trying to do right now. It's all now. right. It's all right. I'm used to it. Um. <laughs> so so Boyd ends up at this fort in the Sierra Nevadas that is basically there for no reason at all, other than to hose uh, the sort of misfits of the army. Like anyone who gets washed out, who doesn't fit in, is basically sent there to rot. 
Um, there's there's a whole cast of characters. There's uh, David Arquette's character, who's this bumbling drug addict. Um, uh, there's uh, uh, the uh, Steven Spinell's Knox, who's basically this alcoholic doctor. Uh, I think he only practiced, I think they mentioned the movie only re actually really practiced uh, veterinary. Uh, uh, <laughs> but well, but you, you've got your you've got your coterie of characters. You've got the drunk. You've got the the hippie. Yeah. You know the pot the pothead. You've got the super aggressive crazy soldier guy. Yeah. You've got the um, Jeffrey Jones character. Um, and you know exactly what I mean when I say the Jeffrey Jones character. <laughs> um, if you know anything, you know, like he's that guy, and he's awesome. Uh, you've got the uh, vaguely uh, helpful Native American characters who know just enough to move the exposition along, but don't actually do anything to impact the plot. Yeah. Um, you've got, uh, who am I missing? Um, uh... Yeah. I think Basically, people who are going to get killed towards the end of the movie, yeah. you know, you you got a, a, a uh, you got the preacher guy, preacher oh, character, yes, yes, um, yes, yes, Jeremy Davies, who yeah. you're talking to Saving Private Ryan, yeah. um, really amazed that he did not have or has not had, I you know, the a more impressive career, like because you watch Saving Private Ryan and then you see this and you think this is the guy that's going places. But, yeah. like, it's been 15 years, you know? Yeah. Um, the, the and he's been in some stuff. I'm not trying to say, you know, oh, he went nowhere. But, you know, like, this was a guy, this was like, this is an Oscar caliber kind of guy. And he just never fell in that role. Yeah. The, um, the, unfortunately. Yeah, the range between uh, his um, his character here and, and the character in Saving Private, Saving Private Ryan is actually night and day, pretty much. Like, very different characters. Um but yeah, so basically, um, uh, Boyd is is shipped off to this fort, and actually, he's actually kind of happy with it because he he sort of feels like he should be isolated from people because he's having some very weird feelings about his whole ordeal. It's something a bit more than just your typical uh, post traumatic stress disorder. Uh, um, so, so he's he's basically going through the motions at this place. He's meeting the people. They're all misfits. They're all weird. Um, you could almost change the movie at this point into like a situational comedy of some sort, com considering how some of these characters are. And there actually is sort of a underlying sort of co comedic element to this entire film, really. I, I kind of categorize this film more as a black comedy than yeah. really as a horror film. I mean, it definitely has horror elements and it has a violence and gore and that sort of thing, but it's really more... It's definitely pointed more towards that kind of Evil Dead 2 kind of vibe, like mm -hmm. less slapsticky, but still that very specific kind of tone. And I think that um, the, the, the real triumph of this film is that it manages to find that tone and keep it throughout. Yeah. Um, you know, like, that's really what I kind of come back to in this film and what makes it unique, um, is that it, it doesn't really feel like any other movie. Anyway, please uh, continue. I'm just, okay. uh, again, um, sticking my face in there. Yeah. Um, so, uh, one really, uh, cold, snowy night, um, enter, uh, one Mr. Calhoun, um, Robert, Robert Carlyle, yep. who is now, uh, on Once Upon a Time, if you're an American TV fan. Oh, is he? Uh, yeah, my, my wife watched that show for a while, so, um, you know, I, I recognize him from that, uh, <laughs> which is kind of funny, but. Yeah, but, but he comes in, he's, um. He comes in emaciated, uh, disheveled, torn up naked. Clothes, naked. Um, uh, you do get a nice ass shot if you're so inclined to yeah. uh, want to see Robert Carlyle's ass. Yeah. Um, there is a mighty fine ass shot in this. Yeah, chicka chicka bow wow, exactly. Um, I was impressed. Well, nice, nicely done. <laughs> you know? But but he comes in and he gives them this very harrowing story about his uh, wagon train. Uh, the fate that befell them where they ended up stranded uh, by the snow in the mountains and essentially cannibalism happened and he he tells them that he was the lucky person to escape this uh, insane uh, army uh, major, Major uh, Ives uh, who apparently decided to, st or actually Colonel Ives, uh, sorry, to uh, start up uh, a little bit of cannibalism, first eating the dead and then starting to kill people in the wagon train and eat them. Uh, so basically, um, 
Jeffrey Jones' uh, uh, character, uh, Colonel Hart, uh, decides, well, we got to set off and do a rescue party because there might still be people alive down there and we have to do something about it. And also it's basically, you know, they have nothing to do. Like, they're sitting at this fort with basically no mission they're not protecting anything. They're not doing anything. So all these people you are... Just, you kind of imagine they're literally just sitting around jerking off all day. Yeah. Like, it's just sort of like that. that's what they're expected to do. Like, you're... We can't get rid of you. You're in the military, but we've kind of put you off in the middle of nowhere. We get, like, you have no responsibilities. Just go do your thing. Yeah. You know? So so they so they go there. Uh, they have this uh, little bit of a journey up into the mountains. Uh, during that time, Jeffrey uh, Davies' character, uh, Private Toffler, who is also the basically the chaplain of the fort, and uh, he breaks his leg. No, no, he doesn't break a leg. He he hurts his he hurts his ribs. He, he, he yeah, he like, breaks a rib. I mean, it's not really made clear exactly what he does, but he hurts himself to where he is um, not easily able to be moved. Yeah. Um, and then there's this very troubling scene during the night where he wakes up, basically the entire camp wakes up screaming, hearing his screams, because uh, Robert Carlyle's character, uh, Calhoun, is licking his wound. What? 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 What is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Oh, God. What's the matter? Wake up. Wake up. What? He was licking. What? He was... He was licking. No. He was licking me! Uh, drinking the blood of his wound. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, Car uh, Coughlin confessed that he did indulge in a bit of the cannibalism during, uh, during the... Uh, when his wagon train was stranded. Um, and he basically, at, the, at this point, his character sort of goes into uh, almost a bit of a psychosis where um, he, he's, just, he's, he's just right off right off the plot and he's starting to unnerve the rest of the party. Uh, he, he does suggest that they tie him up because he can't be trusted. Um, and so they do so. And they finally find the cave where this uh, wagon train supposedly um, took took up uh, took up uh, shop to uh, run out the winter. Winter, um, and here's where the the movie takes uh, really basically takes a, a left turn. Uh, it, it's it it so happens that uh, Carlisle is actually the cannibal, and he was setting these people up for the whole thing just to get them in a spot where he could take advantage of them and start to kill and eat them. Um, and he does so in actually pretty spectacular fashion. He, he, he sits, he, he, he gives a great, great, great performance. I gotta say, this is one of the, he gives favorites. a pair of great performances. Yeah. I would, I would say because he both does the Calhoun character uh, or the co I couldn't quite get how they're pronouncing his name, but he gets he does the the kind of scared um, village idiot type, you know, the the kind of milk toast guy, and then later on, you know, spoiler, but uh, he turns out to be Ives himself, yeah. and like as that character, he is, you know, um, I had forgotten that element of the movie, like you know, it's kind of it's been a few years since I'd seen it, and then I rewatched it, and it's just like, man, like. Uh, I didn't see it coming either time. It's it's one of those like funny little things where, you know, it's like oh, and then there's this guy who shows up, and then oh, there's going to be the the crazy events that happen. I had forgotten all the details of the plot. You know, I kind of knew the tone of it, but I'd forgotten that that was the same guy. Yeah. So, um, uh, very effective pair of performances because I bought him both as the oh, this guy's going to come and kill me guy and then the guy who it turns out the guy who's actually going to come kill you yeah you know, sort of thing so um very effective um really uh in a amazing cast which we've we've kind of talked a lot about the you know we've talked a bit about how great this cast is a very deep cast with no ink links uh, yeah, i think uh I carlisle is uh very probably mvp of the film honestly yeah, yeah. um uh, well, I, I I might disagree with that a little later on, um, but I, I'll say this: he he fl he flips the switch as far as acting goes. You're right. Like, okay, David Arquette. 
I get it. <laughs> you know, you're right. Yeah, but oh. um, so so basically, the, uh, Carlisle's character Calhoun Ives, whichever one you want to go with, um, he he kills he kills the party uh, that's there. Um, most of them anyway. Uh, uh, what's what's his name? Um, uh, Neil McDonough's character, Private Reich, which is the uber alpha male soldier, him, he and, um... And what a Boyd. name, Private Reich. Yeah. You know, just to <laughs> hear that name, and anything you ever thought about that character, it's exactly true. Yeah, he and, he and Boyd try to chase down uh, Calhoun, and it doesn't end very well for them. Uh, they both, like, well, basically, uh, Reich gets killed thrown off a cliff basically he doesn't die right away but he he's thrown off a cliff and uh calhoun basically corners um boyd but there's this weird connection between them because it seems like calhoun senses something about boyd and and boyd actually sort of sensed something about calhoun when he was originally telling a story of cannibalism like you know immediate immediate hey something's a light bulb's clicking in my head like he's he's kind of curious like uh, how did you feel after you ate a person and drank their blood and, and such? Um, so, and uh, we'll probably get into more of that connection later, but uh, at this point, Boyd, basically, he to save his life, uh, he shoots Calhoun uh, right in the shoulder, and Calhoun gets up. Like, he, he gets up like it never happened. Uh, so Boyd's like, well, I gotta get the fuck out of here. And he jumps right off the cliff, and he ends up in the same sort of, like, sinkhole as... Um, Private Reich does, and of course, uh, uh, Boyd breaks his leg, uh, he's laying there, he could be left to die, uh, but he eventually has to make the choice to, um, basically, uh, feast off of, uh, off of, uh, Reich's, uh, body, and he gains strength from it and heals his wounds, and that is sort of the, there's this undercurrent, uh, that the, uh, Indian characters, uh, bring up of the, myth of the uh, Wendigo, or Wendigo, whichever way you want to pronounce it, which is sort of this uh, northern... I looked it up on Wikipedia. There are about 85 different spellings of this yeah. myth. Um, because it's a bunch of white people trying to transliterate a Native American thing. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but, but... Know, in the, in the like, 1840s. So, you know, yeah. just to be clear. <laughs> but it, it is, uh, it is, it is actually probably, like, one of the most famous um, Native American uh, myths or legends uh, out there right next to, like, uh, Gloose Cap in uh, Canada uh, or, like, the Thunderbird or something along those lines. It, it's, it's a very... And it's one that's been used in horror movies quite a bit. Um, it, it involves... Uh, basically involves cannibalism. Um, this malevolent spirit will inhabit your body if you eat someone and you will gain this undying hunger, and you'll have to keep eating and eating and eating, and it'll turn you into this monster. It, basically, it was a uh, a way to, um, a myth to make make people, you know, don't eat people. I mean, during a hard winter, don't eat people. I mean, this was a cult, these were cultures that were uh, living off the land, and sometimes you had really bad winters where there was no food. So, it, it was sort of like, sort of a, preventative uh tale you know sort of a, like a cautionary tale don't eat people <laughs> basically yeah i'll de i'll definitely have more to say about the uh wendigo myth and the elements of that mo the movie kind of when we get towards the end so um i'm gonna put a pin on that for right mm. now but um remind me i definitely want to talk a bit about okay. that um and kind of the implications of that so mm. so so basically uh, the rest of the movie follows um boyd's journey he he regains his strength from from eating the flesh of uh, reich uh goes back to the fort to confront uh uh, uh well actually he doesn't he, he's not going to the fort to confront uh uh he Calhoun. goes back to the fort because that's the only fucking place to yeah. go yeah um and when he gets there it turns out that ives is calhoun and is now being put in charge of the fort by the same commanding officer who has put uh, Boyd out there to begin with, uh, they have some confrontation about, like... Um, and at this point, Boyd just looks crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, Guy Pierce, um, I'm totally giving it his all, just looks like a crazy person. Like, yeah. you know, oh my god, he's... No, 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 he's, he's got a... Uh, 
I shot him, I killed him, you know, this is the guy who's been eating people, and it's like, everybody thinks Boyd is the one who's been doing these things, and that's a definitely a running theme towards this section of the film. Yeah. Uh, they even make uh, Carlisle take off his shirt to prove that he hasn't been shot, and he's completely healed. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a very kind of interestingly tense moment there. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, just to kind of get over a little section, a little complex section of plot there. But yeah. uh, please continue with your uh, story there. Mm, but but no, um, like, th- and this is of course where where uh, Carlisle's uh, switch in character really comes comes f- to the forefront. Uh, he's much more uh, debonair, dashing, reserved, uh, intellectual sort of character. He's not the gibbering maniac that just came out of the wild. Um, and of course, he conv- he's convinced basically everyone at the fort that he is who he says he is, and and so yeah, Boyd is uh, basically you know he's everyone gives him a wary eye. Everyone's like, yeah, we can't trust this guy. We're gonna have to lock him up uh, eventually because he attacks uh, Calhoun uh, Ives um, and tries to kill him. So basically, he's he's put in uh, he's put in chains, and this allows uh, Ives to uh, basically pick off the remaining people in the fort as he so pleases because he has his grand plan now that he will use this fort as sort of a place to uh, prey on lone strangers, people with no real connection to anybody else, you know, people that people people won't miss and they can they can sort of uh live off these people and grow stronger and stronger as the years go on um and so and he so he he admits as much to uh Boyd as they talk because well he's trying to like because he they they it's definitely that like predator prey relationship between Boyd and Ives but also a kind of meeting of equals in a way because they both have this experience yeah. and there's a wary uh alliance is the wrong word but a, a wary respect or a wary uh recognition of something similar in the other on both sides yeah. um because you do get these kind of you know Ives is playing this part of the debonair, you know, amazing person to the rest of the world, but he knows that Boyd sees him for who he is, and he knows that everything that Boyd says about him is true. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when he confronts Boyd as a person, he doesn't even like pretend. He's just like, well, yeah. So I saw that you ate the other dude. You know how yeah. good for you. You know, like sort of thing. Um, you should. We should. We should. You know. And eventually, he he suggests they join forces and, and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Um, the very interesting dynamic, you know, where, you know, you could have played this very differently and kind of made it seem like maybe Boyd is just crazy, but the, the narrative of the film doesn't play it that way at all. It just plays it as, you know, um, you yeah. know, Ives just pull the wool over people's eyes, but not over the, the audience is, is always in on the, uh, the truth of the matter, you know? Yeah. And this is, this is sort of the interesting thing. Like, I think we talked about this a little bit like a week ago or so off camera or off, uh, recording um how there is a dynamic to this movie that's much more like a vampire movie than a cannibal movie um although there's there's definitely similarities between vampire movies cannibal movies werewolf movies and stuff at a base level um i mean carlisle's character when he turns to ives i mean he's very much a vampire at this point like he is like bella lugosi uh level sort of vampire like very seductive uh very intense um and it's almost like he's trying to seduce Boyd over to the dark side to make him a vampire, um, and, and that, that's sort of that what that dynamic is. I, I feel between the two, um, and yeah, basically he's trying to he's trying to turn he's trying to get rid of Boyd's soul. He's trying to make Boyd as evil as he is, and so he can capitulate in in uh, his plan to, you know, basically feed off anyone who comes by in the fort. Um, and, and I th- Well, and there's such a... Uh, I did not get a chance to look this up. You know, it is kind of one of those... Uh, I don't know if the writer or the director uh, were vegetarians, but there's a recurring theme of, like, eating and yes. eating meat in this film. You know, the, whole, the, the film is called 
ravenous, you know, and it's about like this, this like inner hunger and the, you know, the idea that, well, you have to kill or be killed. And, you know, like I, I ate meat today, you know, like, um, I, I didn't eat human meat, but I, I certainly ate meat. And, um, the, you know, Boyd at the beginning of this film, you know, there's, there's a, a great focus on like plates Mm-hmm. And like bloody meat, and like the, yeah. the fact that like the 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 visceral reality of like what you're actually doing when you you know kill an animal and then consume its flesh is you know, you know you are you are taking its essence and putting it into you. Yeah. And the film very uh, visually and very viscerally uh, puts you into that place in terms of cannibalism and saying, well, if eating the flesh of a cow is is sustenance for your bones than maybe eating the flesh of a human being is sustenance for your mind or your spirit or your soul or yeah. gives you some of these 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 power kind of powerful spiritual hearing healing qualities mm. um and it's very visual it's very you know one of the things i like about the film overall is how um you know, it's it's fairly low budget. It is not um, this kind of big glossy production. Um, it's very much shot in real places. Yeah. Um, it's very much, uh, you know, it kind of has this gritty. We didn't have money to gloss this up very much kind of feel. Um, when people get hurt, it looks like it hurts. Yeah. You know, like when people cut into each other or when people are bleeding. You know, it looks like there's somebody actually lying there bleeding. It, it does not look like a special effect. And um, all credit to that. I mean, it put me in mind of uh, some of the things we were saying about the uh, about Kill List. Yes. Um, in our early episode, you know, when um, very different effect in a lot of ways, um, and obviously a different level of kind of technology and what people expect. Um, very different tone, mm-hmm. but um, there's a lot. You know, when Boyd breaks his leg at the bottom of that. Of that sinkhole, yeah, the bone sticking out, um, yeah. and the bone sticking out, and the camera doesn't linger over it, but the camera doesn't like look away either. You know, it's yeah. not it's not meant to be a like, oh, look at how cool that effect is. It's meant to look like, oh my god, that fucking looks like it hurts. Um, yeah, and, and, and the the tone yeah. set in that pit where he's deciding whether he's gonna take the he's gonna basically bite the bullet and eat uh, some of Reich to get out of there. Reich dies in the pit, and his eyes are wide open, and they're almost, like, acu- accusing him, you know, they're staring right at him, like, you, you motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there's a very, um, I mean, Boyd is cool, you know, I, 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 I said, you know, Carlisle is MVP, um, in terms of, I think, acting, um, versatility, in terms of what he's kind of asked to do, but clearly Guy Pierce is the the motivator of this film, and um, really, in a in a lot of ways, a thankless role. And, you know, there, there's not he doesn't get like big speeches here. He doesn't get like big moments. He doesn't say it's anything. It's very for... quiet and very. Um, it's all done with his eyes and his body language. Yeah, he doesn't. And, he doesn't say uh, anything yeah. for the first half hour, pretty much. Like he, he's very. <laughs> he, I would. I would love to sit down and just count the number of lines this guy has in the movie. It is. It is not very for the lead in a major picture. You know, uh-huh. motion picture. Not very many. <laughs> yeah. um, he spends a lot of time alone or reacting to the other people around him. Um, uh, guy Pierce, uh, really amazing actor. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Anytime I see Guy Pearce in a movie, it makes me want to watch L.A. Confidential again. Yeah, Just L.A. Confidential. Like uh, another one I'd recommend is uh, Animal Kingdom that he's in, which is an excellent crime movie set in Australia. Or It's either Australia or New Zealand, one or the other, but it's awesome. I haven't seen that. I'm going to have to watch it. That's, yeah. uh, so anyway... Um, uh, please continue. I was just uh, kind of using that moment to interject. So yeah, um, uh, you're actually correct. Antonia Bird is a vegetarian, or she was a vegetarian. She sadly uh, died last year. Uh, yeah, um, I learned that when I was doing my research that she died last year, and I felt really bad that I didn't know she died until yeah. Yeah, I looked it up. And but. Guy Pierce is a vegetarian as well, but he actually during the opening scene you mentioned where they had the plates of meat with basically just raw, almost almost raw, basically rare steak sitting in blood. And 
Uh, he actually chewed that and spit it out after they yelled cut in the scene. Right. So, you know, uh, given he's a vegetarian, uh, quite the trooper there to do that. And actually what makes that scene more gross to me is hearing the flies in the background right. going around. Well, and again, it goes back to that like visceral thing. Like, mm-hmm. um, you know, the idea that, well, it's 1847 and they're, they're serving meat. So it's been killed recently. There, I mean, there's no refrigeration. Yeah. Like, there's some guy sitting off stage, essentially, you know, with a hatchet, like killing mm-hmm. and carving this, these, these cows. Yeah. Um, meaning that there's, you know, a bunch of dead cow carcasses, you know, the stuff they can't <laughs> use, and there are flies. Flo- I mean, it's such a like telling little bit that there are just kind of flies around. Yeah. But it, it sells the kind of viscerality and the in the reality of that moment, um, in a in a in a very subtle but I think a very effective way. Um, yeah. I I really love the you know this is not like a movie I go back to often, but I love the tone of this movie and I love the way that it's uh, structured and the way that it's it really tells its story in a very effective way. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, but yeah, again. Yeah. So, um, so basically, uh, 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 Calhoun, um, or Ives, whichever one you want to go for, um, cannibal guy, cannibal, I'm cannibal, cannibal guy. guy, cannibal guy, um, so yeah, he, or he, cannibal he, gee, if cannibal you're Canadian, gee, I suppose, gee, yeah, beer gee, yeah, shout out, um, basically, <laughs> uh, basically he wants, um, he wants John Boyd, he wants Boyd to, uh, join up with him and he's also got another person in his uh in his little party uh colonel hart jeffrey jones's character he actually resurrected him basically um and brought him into the fold and that's an interesting part of the film and that's where i say for me jeffrey jones is actually the mvp as far as acting goes in this film because i think his character there even though his background is not as fleshed out uh, there is something about his character, like, how did this guy end up at this fort? Because he seems like a very articulate, very smart, uh, very intelligent person um, who understands people. Um, so he must have done something that really got him... Dr- may, 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 I, may I tell my assumption in okay. that moment? Like, if you ask me, my assumption is he's gay. Okay. That might be it. Um, not not or or has some other thing that is uh, just makes him, uh, you know, if he's a gay man who hit on someone at officer school or or whatever, mm-hmm. um, hit on the wrong person, um, tried to do the wrong thing, was caught with the wrong person, and uh, was banished to this place. Uh, that that fits as well as anything. We're given no indication about what it is, but even just being like an intellectual, I mean, there are there is no place for intellectuals in the world of this movie. You know, let's just let's just you know, being a guy collecting books and eating walnuts and being kind of a quiet, soft-spoken guy and talking about the Mexican-American War, um, you know, a time of manifest destiny, which we're I think we're going to get to pretty mm-hmm. shortly here in a, a time of, uh, you know, when it was kill or be killed. Yeah. Um, you know, or at least that's the the world that the movie is setting up, you know, this kind of frontier land. Um, you can kind of say he's whatever you want to be, whatever you want him to be. Um, but he's a guy who is, you know, he he does not have a a hardness to him. He does not have a heart, you know, he doesn't have calluses on his hands. He's a very mm-hmm. soft kind of guy. And he is, quote unquote, killed very quickly in the uh, confrontation with Ives at the cave. Yeah. And then when he comes back later, um, you know, he's very uh, prone to go with the winner. Um, he's yeah. very, um, well, I have now eaten flesh. I now know what this is like. This is the way my life is going to be now. And I'm just going to go with uh, the cannibal guy because that's just kind of what life is like. This is just what we do now. I'm going to eat people. And then changes his mind almost immediately yeah, um, well, well, again. I, you know. i got to say, I think the thing is like he's probably down down to the to the basics i think he's probably the most one of the most moral characters in this 
uh, movie, and I think mm-hmm. I think the fact that he first embraces the cannibalism and seems on board with it at first is because this is a guy who is looking for any change, anything to get him out of the situation he was in, and he might see it as that, but uh, he, he quickly comes to the realization that this isn't me, this is, I've become a terrible, terrible thing, and I need to die. I really do. Because uh, there's this little there's this little visual connection at the beginning of the movie and near the end of the movie where he's having really difficult time cracking walnuts. But then he can do it with his hands. And you can tell it actually kind of scares him. Like, he, he he's like, oh my god, like, what have I become right. that I can do you, this you, now? You definitely see in the performance. Uh, I think, you know, Jeffrey Jones really inhabits his character in this in a way that isn't even really on the page, I wish there was like an extra five minutes. I wish there was a little bit more of a conversation or a little bit more you kind of saw where the turn was coming from. Mm-hmm. Um, because it does feel, I mean, if there's one complaint I have about the script of this film, which I, I really don't, um, I do think that the turn that Jeffrey Jones makes from, oh, this is just how we live now, where I'm going to be a cannibal and we'd like to have you on board with us, to, oh, why don't you slip my throat now, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it feels a little bit sudden. I'd like there to be at least a little bit more breathing room there. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's 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 a little bit more of a quibble um, because I think the performance sells it. Um, but, I, I you know, I, I do think that on the page it, it lacks just a bit. I'd like to see it be a little bit more fleshed out. But, yeah, I um, again, that. quibble. Um, yeah. So, so basically we get near the end of the film. It's, it's basically... Now Boyd basically pretending that he's going to side with um, Ives. But, of course, uh, he, he, he talks with, with Hart, uh, ends up uh, giving him basically mercy-killing Hart at his request. And so the last little bit of the last act, basically, of the film is, uh, is uh, Boyd and Ives fighting. And there's still this seduction thing going on because it's like Ives is like, okay... You might kill me, but are you going to be able to resist uh, eating me <laughs> after I die? Right. Uh, 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 Boyd sets up this trap for uh, for Ives, um, where they'll both be trapped and killed essentially. And um, it's and basically Ives is like, if I die first, are you going to eat me to sustain your life and get out of this trap? This big fucking bear trap, by the way, that he he sets up for them to fall into, um, and and uh, I, I I guess I won't spoil the ending too much. Not that it's like you know it's an old old movie at this point, so no big spoilers. But uh, the moral decision that Boyd uh, has to make at the end is really good. It's it's a redeeming there. There's a redemptive quality to Boyd's character because I I think that that stems again from uh, the heart character. I, I think. The Hart character makes a point that this Wendigo curse, um, you don't have to go the route of um, Calhoun. You can actually make a moral choice and end your own life and stop the curse. And so... Um, the- well, that's the, uh, that's the thing uh, Boyd is asking the uh native american trope i would mm-hmm. say native american character but they're not really a character no, but not really. um they they you know he he spends some time asking how do you defeat this thing how do, how can i beat the wendigo the win- i want to say maningo it's kind of one of those <laughs> um uh how do i beat the Wendi- the the wendigo you know and uh she she tells him like you you all the all the Wendigo all the Wendigo does is is eat. It takes it takes it takes. The way you beat it is to give, yeah. and you have to give yourself to it, and that's how you know, that's how you beat it. And in this kind of very fragmentary, like not like as specifically as I just said it, but um, it really sets up the sacrifice. I mean, you know, the 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 stakes are you can beat it, you can you can defeat it, but you have to just give yourself to it. Like that's the yeah. way to beat it. Um, and sets up the the end of the film, which I mean, we've kind of we we, I think you were trying not to necessarily give away the end of the film, but no, we we totally just gave away the yeah. end of the film. Um, Guy Pierce sacrifices himself uh, to uh, defeat the the enemy, the the the, the spirit, and uh, the real question is, is he going to uh, partake 
of the the bounteous feast uh, mm -hmm. before he himself expires or not. And um, also, does that make a difference mm -hmm. in terms of the uh, overall uh, things that are going to happen in the future? Because uh, while that's happening, we get a a, a little bit where the uh, commanding officer kind of shows up and eats the stew that yes. is made up of the um, meaning that this amazing sacrifice that Guy Pierce is making by killing himself to prevent this horror on the world is actually not really worth anything because there is now another person who is going to have this uh, this ravenous desire to eat flesh. Yeah, um, it's it's very so, it's very um, telling because the Indian character, the uh, the female Indian character, she she gets the hell out of that fort as, as soon as she she like she she went to get the uh, commanding officer played by John Spencer. This was actually, I think, his last movie role. He was he was in West Wing as well. That was like he did TV exclusively until he died, apparently. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, she she comes back with him and she finds uh, Boyd and I. If you watch the movie, you'll know his face and just go, yes. "I know that guy from something." Yeah. That's yeah. But she she finds Boyd and Ives, and then she's out of there. Like she's gone, and so yeah, the it's 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 definitely in it's definitely hinted, uh, not even hinted. It's basically guaranteed that the curse is going to go on. It's to some other some other uh, place in time, but. Um, it's 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 much more about Boyd and and Ives and their relationship together. Like, is it just me or is there's this almost sort of semi uh, homosexual vibe between the two characters? Like, there's almost a very seductive quality. There, whenever whenever you have a uh, you know, this is the gay episode apparently because you know <laughs> um, you know um, I'm fine with that. Every episode could be the gay episode as far as I'm concerned. Um, but uh, I, I do think that, um, you know, you can read it that way if you want to read it that way. Um, I, I wouldn't argue with you. Um, I don't know how much of that is, you know, intended by the filmmakers mm -hmm. and by the actors. Um, you know, seduction doesn't have to always be overtly sexual. Yeah. Um, if you want to view it that way and you want to view it as a sort of, uh, you know, homosexual is a... Is a, yeah, is a you know, if you want to view it that way, I I, I won't I wouldn't argue I, with I'm you. Not, but, I'm not uh, I'm not overtly saying it's gay. Like I'm not saying the two characters were homosexuals. I'm just saying that it 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 sort of it sort of stems again from that vampire thing, where right. where actually sexuality and in vampirism kind of becomes almost uh, asexual. Like it, it doesn't matter. It could be a it could be a man. It could be a woman. It, all it is is about the attraction, and the you know basically the the domination from one to the other. Uh, that's sort of almost like a sadomasochist uh, relationship, and to some level between the vampire and the victim. Well, uh, certainly, and and in this, I mean, one of the things I'll say is that the film almost makes a point of being very focused on the individual characters mm -hmm. in the, you know, like it, it really like in terms of the plot mechanics, in terms of like what's actually going on on screen. They're really not talking about any kind of bigger picture or any kind of. It's just, yeah. I need to eat people. You know, the the supernatural elements are even like fairly subdued here, um, uh, which I actually really like about the film is yeah, that too. you know, with you know, like you could change very like a handful of elements in this film and make it a movie that's really just about cannibals that people just like eating each other, and you mm -hmm. could just remove the entire. Um, you know the the healing factor sort of element of it. Um, once you take that out, this is not a movie about any kind of supernatural thing or any kind of spiritual thing. This is a movie about um, just a cannibal and yeah. like people who like the taste of human flesh. Um, which I really love the psychology of that, and I think that the performances in particular um, sell it as that first, and anything that's on top of that comes later. Um, which again kind of comes back to that kind of gritty, earthy reality of it. It's mm -hmm. sold, you know, they make stew with like potatoes and carrots and onions out of people. You know, this isn't, you know, a Hannibal Lecter, fava beans, and, and a nice Chianti. Yeah. This is, you know, this is, there's this big pot that's filled with meat, and if we don't eat it, we're going to starve. And that's mm -hmm. sort of the attitude that the film takes towards food in general yeah. and towards their hunger is. 
you know, of course you would eat this because it's the food that's that's available to you. You know, if you don't eat this, you're going to starve. Um, I really like that element of it. I, I, uh, it's again one of my one of my favorite things about the film. Yeah. Um, but I do think that there are some uh, some larger themes at work here. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't mind me, nope. kind of uh, opining. Um, definitely talking about manifest destiny. I mean, they kind of make a point of comparing the uh, hunger that the cannibals have for uh, human flesh with the kind of hunger that the um, growing nation-state has for territory. Um, There's definitely that. I mean, that is explicitly made in the film. It's not a kind of major... They don't spend a lot of time on it, but it's definitely there. Um, again, something I'm glad that they didn't spend a lot of time on because I, you know, the, I wouldn't want them to hammer that metaphor home too hard. Yeah. Um, you know, it is, uh, this takes place during the Mexican American war and the, you know, kind of initial scenes that are during that conflict, which was, you know, ultimately about the United States gaining territory and, and, uh, enforcing its will upon, uh, native populations and all that sort of thing. Um, I don't know. How does that play you as a Canadian, by the way? I was just curious. I was thinking about it earlier. Like, I bet this might play differently to Americans than Canadians. Although, you know, how many Americans are really going to have, like, a detailed understanding of the uh, the root causes of the Mexican-American War at this point, you know? Well, no, it doesn't... I mean, it doesn't really strike me as vastly alien or anything like that, because, I mean, although I am Canadian... We we are essentially indoctrinated by uh, Americanisms, American media, American everything, to some degree. So I mean, we 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 are aware of it, you know. So it's not like it's a big surprise or anything like that. And I think we I think, gave you imperialism; you gave us Alan. Well, no, Dick. no, 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 it's, no, no, it's no, even. no. You know, no, we're good. No, 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 no. Listen, the Commonwealth gave you imperialism, <laughs> um, but but uh, but. Uh, um, we inherit. We both inherited it from the British Isles. We That's blame right. the Brits. Done. Uh, specific, you know? Specifically, uh, our British friends like Terry Kay and the Urban yeah, yeah. Viking and you scumbags. Uh, um, Rob, Rob Derbyshire. Yeah, I'm looking at you. I'm looking yeah. at you. Uh, yeah. this, this is for all the beer geeks out there who don't know anything right. about what we also do. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, no, it, it it makes very good points. And again, I agree with you totally. The subtlety. Uh, in the way they do it is much more effective. It's much more, uh, just the ideas that Ives has boiling in his brain are much more horrific because he's hinting at them and the possibilities of what he could do if his plans actually, uh, go forth. And, and then of course it goes into the bigger picture, of course, of like imperialism and stuff like that. But, um, the, the fact that they hint at it and they don't beat you over the head with it. Uh, so it's not preachy. It's just like, here's some really uncomfortable possibilities that could happen. The, and again, kind of going back to that earthy kind of, uh, low scale, not, you know, the, the, you know, not making Big Airy speech is nature of it. You know, mm-hmm. these feel like men of their time. They don't feel like 20th or, you know, late 20th century men um, opining about the past. These feel like people inhabiting a particular place in time. And that definitely comes down to the acting. I'm, yeah. I'm a, uh, you know, again, this is a very deep cast. You know, there, there are no weak links here. No. Um and, uh, you know, really worth seeing, if only for the cast. But there's also plenty of other great stuff in this film. So, yeah, you know. and I think that's, I think it's uh, very telling that uh, this, this was a film that was plagued with production problems at the beginning. Uh, there, there was a director before Anto- uh, Antonio Bird, uh, Milcho Manchevsky was the original director, and he got replaced uh, early on in the production, and uh, Antonia Bird was basically flown in at the last minute to do this film. Um, so there were problems, but the cast and I think basically the entire production team around it basically bucked up and made a really, really great film that otherwise could have been just another one of these, like, ended up as, like, a direct-to-video piece of trash that no one cared about, you know, but instead it actually got a theatrical release, and 
it was it a, made a little it made a little bit of money not mm -hmm. a lot of money but it's had an instant life on on you know on quote unquote home video yeah um and now it's actually available on netflix streaming so you can I, that's actually how i watched it i was mm -hmm. planning on getting the disc and like watching it and then i looked it up and i'm like oh yeah i can just stream this um I do remember I listened to the director commentary with Antonia mm -hmm. Bird when I watched it originally because I did get the disc when I watched it six or seven years ago. Yeah. Um, and I remember that being a fun commentary that's worth watching. Um, mm -hmm. I can't say any more than that, but um, it is it is nice to get to uh, to listen to, especially now that she's uh, now passed on. Yeah. I think it would be uh, worth listening to that just to kind of uh, hear her talk about. Um, Talk about the film. And uh, before we uh, get to, I, th I feel we're starting to wind down here. Uh, before I get to that, though, I, I, I uh, just get your thoughts on the uh, soundtrack for this film. Oh, I, I, I do have one more topic uh, I want to cover briefly. Okay. Yep. Um, but I do, um, I was actually, I'm glad you mentioned it because I think the soundtrack is amazing. Yeah, okay. In fact, um, after I watched the, I watched, I finished the film this afternoon, and then I was doing a little bit of, uh, of homework for for my classes. So uh, I was uh, doing a little bit, and I, I put on Spotify, and I was uh, trying to find the soundtrack to see if anybody had uh, done a soundtrack for it on Spotify, and I couldn't find it in like you know ninety seconds of looking. Um, but I would love to like be able to just listen to this. Uh, individually um it's a very quirky kind of interesting score um it, it's uh it's not you know when you talk about uh kind of individualistic or quirky scores and kind of historical pictures you know it's often like something that's like intentionally anachronistic you know like mm -hmm. um um, and not necessarily in a bad way, you know, if you talk about, like, Django Unchained or something, yeah. which has, you know, a, a rap song in the middle of it, um, <laughs> which is very, very well used, I think. Um, one day we're going to have to review that film, Definitely I, I'm, is. you know. Um, but, um, you know, this isn't like that, but it definitely does not do the... Uh, you know, the kind of standard historical epic, epic Spielberg. The same in Private Ryan. We're going to put on the big sweeping music. Yeah. You know, we're going to put on... Um, there's that very easy thing that you do in historical pictures to just kind of uh, do something that feels very kind of epic and with grandeur, and this is history. And, we're, and uh, no, this feels very lived in and very real. I mean, it feels like the kind of thing that, like, if you were to be making this film in 1847... But you just magically had modern technology uh -huh. to do it, you know. You know, um, it feels like the sort of thing that they, you know, it just it doesn't feel like it's looking backwards from now. It feels like it's looking to today from 1847, if that makes yeah. sense. Uh, you know? Yeah, because like basically what they did with this soundtrack, um, there was two people involved with it: uh, Damon Albarn and uh, Michael Nyman, and basically they. They didn't. They didn't so much collaborate as they basically each did a part of the soundtrack. And what they did is, um, although there are a few traditional kind of things involved in the soundtrack, they had like you know they had like traditional instruments like violin, guitar, stuff like that. But then they went towards more esoteric um, traditional instruments from like the Appalachian region, like the Jew harp, the banjo, the squeeze box things of that nature, and they brought it together, and I, I feel like the, the the big standout piece in it is, I think it's called Boyd's Journey or something along those lines, it's like the title track, and then there's like a reprise at the end uh, that's slightly different. Um, I think it just works so well, because uh, sort of like uh, where Ser Sergio Leone connected his soundtracks to his characters, this one mm -hmm. connects to Boyd's character very well. It's very melancholy, sad, and tragic in this sort of upbeat almost way with the uh, overlying instruments, but down in the underneath it, there's that plucking of the banjo. <laughs> right, right, right. And it's very unnerving and it, it gives that hint that there's something really wrong here going on with this character. It, he's looking for redemption, but at the same time, there's something biting at him deep underneath it, it's it's a little bit like playing like a mozart's requiem but doing it on a ukulele mm. there's a, that's a little bit of the feeling you get listening to this to the score um really effective um 
I I really am probably going to rewatch this film or or try to find do something a little bit more substantial to try to find the score. Um, but, I think you can find it on uh, YouTube. Uh, sure I something. didn't look on YouTube. That was that's probably that probably should have been my first choice was to look on YouTube. But um, yeah, no, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna look for that score um, because I would like to listen to it um, uh, again without like watching the film and just kind of let yeah. it wash over me because that's a really really interesting score. Yeah. So you had something else you wanted to bring up? Yeah, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about the the Wendigo um, myth and um, just sort of some because I did a little bit of reading. I mean, you know, which means I read the Wikipedia article. You know, like not to uh, not to like uh, overestimate the amount of research I did <laughs> for this podcast, but I was like, I, you know, because I don't um, watch a lot of uh, you know, I'm not as well versed in the horror genre as you are, and so I haven't like spent as much time. Um, uh, looking into the way it's been used in modern uh, senses, and just kind of, I just wasn't that familiar with the myth uh, beyond just kind of understanding, oh, it's about eating people, sort of thing. You know, it's a supernatural creature that eats people. Um, one of the things that it connects to is not so much the idea, like cannibalism is a big part of what it is, of what yeah. the myth is about, but it's also about greed. Yeah. Um, it's about this idea of wanting more and more and more, and like connecting that to hunger. Like you have this hunger for for flesh and more flesh and more flesh and you can't ever have enough of it but in a sense you know that's that's a metaphor or a uh way of talking about um greed for for wealth or just having stuff mm -hmm. or or whatever and you know we've talked a little bit about manifest destiny and about like kind of that urge of the nation for land um i was really like kind of thinking about this film, I was like, I really want to see a sequel, you know, which is set, like, 40 years later during the Robber Baron era, you okay. know? Um, like, looking at, like, Standard Oil, and that, you know, like, hey, there will be blood. There will be, yes. Yeah, like, so there there, there <laughs> will be cannibals, you know? Like, that's kind of what I want this movie. I, I would love to see, um, and, and again, I, I've kind of talked about this a little bit in previous episodes, talking about the horror genre, or maybe I, I said it uh, just to you personally, you know, the horror genre can be kind of anything as yeah. long as you deliver the scares. You know, you can do, you know, if you put gore in the right places and, and your horror fans are satisfied, you can kind of make a movie about anything. Um, and I would love to see, like, essentially a period costume drama with a bunch of uh, wealthy industrialists in, you know, like, smoking cigars... <laughs> And eating people, but like have it be a metaphor for like capitalism run amok, you know? Yeah. Um, I I just I got that idea in my head, and I was some I just I couldn't let it go. So um, if somebody wants to make that film, uh, I'll I'll buy a copy. Just oh yeah, to and you could you, you know. could you could you could expand upon that. I mean, you could throw in you could even go like to like sharecropper times or whatever. You know, you could have like a whole slavery angle where these wealthy <laughs> industrialists are basically feeding off their own slaves. You know, like there's a lot well, of let's let's do a cloud atlas with cannibalism <laughs> where you start in like you know the code of Hammurabi. You know, oh, yeah. like, okay. um, you know, you could, you talk about like slavery in ancient Egypt. You could do, um, even if you're just limited to the Americas. I mean, the, uh, the desire for slaves is really about greed. You know, um, you talking about, uh, you know, anything Wall Street excess, Wall Street avarice. I mean, mm -hmm. American Psycho, but with cannibalism. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> This this metaphor is potent because it is universal in a way, and because we do have that feeling that we um, both see the excesses in other people, um, you know, and in terms of this very exaggerated thing, but we also feel the same desires in ourselves, yeah. you know, that, you know, I get greedy and I get, you know, and I try to fight that impulse, and... Uh, the idea of connecting that to something as horrific as cannibalism and and making that comparison explicit, which I think this film, it doesn't quite go that far, but it's kind of making that same point, you know? Yeah, um, it's there if you want to find it, basically. Um, so, uh, and again, 
it's more subtle in the film than, than kind of what I'm talking about, but that was kind of my big idea. I was like having a big idea when I watch mm-hmm. a movie like this. I, li- I like having something to think about, you know, um, uh, afterwards. And a movie that gives me something to think about afterwards is definitely a film that I would recommend. Yeah. Um, you know, so. So, yeah, I guess we can uh, start to wrap down here. Um, basically, we both highly recommend this film, I, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I, I love this film. I really do. Um, it's one of my favorites. I own it. I mean, I, I any any self respecting horror fan, I think, should probably own this film. It's it's a beautiful film, um, and it's, and it is beautiful. Like we didn't really talk about the cinematography and stuff, but like mm-hmm. it is gorgeous, especially made on a and a really small budget um, in, in, for ninety nine. You know, the, mm-hmm. this this is a really uh, you know the cinematography, the uh, the actual. Uh, you know, the mountains and the snow and the the streams and you know that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, we didn't talk about we didn't talk about what, how this film looks, but it it looks gorgeous. Mm, um, it, it was so it, and it was actually shot in like Sol- Slovakia <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. to to double for the Sierra Nevadas, so it, it it looks really great. I mean, you 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 couldn't really tell. I mean, you buy it's the Sierra Nevadas, so yeah, a lot lots of stuff is shot in that part of the world because it's really cheap to shoot there mm-hmm. and it's fucking gorgeous. Yeah. Um. I sorry sorry on a completely different note. Uh, my the the movie Euro Trip came on the other day. Oh yeah. And uh, have you seen that film? Oh yeah, I've seen Euro Trip. Uh, Hostel is um, essentially Euro Trip with murders. <laughs> yeah yeah no no no. Well uh, Euro Trip, fun movie, much more fun than it has any right to be. Mm-hmm. But we're sitting, my wife and I are sitting there, we're flipping channels, and uh, we're watching the scene where they're standing in line at the Louvre and. <laughs> Uh, right before that scene, they're kind of all in a square. Yeah. Um, and they're just sitting and talking to each other, and you get a wide shot. And she and I looked at each other and went, "Well, you, she and I have stood in that square. It's in black. <laughs> um, like it's like it's very, very recognizable. It's like, oh, I know exactly where that is. That's nowhere near Paris. Um, <laughs> they shoot a lot of movies there. Yeah. Um, there's a ton of uh, great." Uh, hilly land there. You're probably going to delete all this from the episode. But, no, uh, actually, I might keep it all in just to be a just to be a dick yeah. to the listeners who who well, don't want a long podcast. Who did who didn't want to listen to me talk about Euro Trip at the end of a horror movie podcast? Yeah. Um, that's just how we roll here, or that's how that's I roll. You know, I always like to have some weird esoteric reference somewhere. Yeah. So you know, I want I want to make people look shit up. That's my goal. <laughs> that's right. Look up Euro Trip, motherfuckers. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't even mention Nabokov. I should have mentioned Nabokov or some shit, you know. <laughs> um, anyway, yes. sorry, so, go ahead and wrap uh, up. So, uh, okay, uh, Daniel, uh, tell people where they can find you on the interwebs. Uh, you can find me, I'm Daniel E. Harper on Twitter and Tumblr, if you want to find me that way. Uh, you can find me, if you want to find me on Facebook, you can. I'm Daniel Harper. Um, I'm friends with Lee. It should be easy to find. Um, the big thing that I do on the internet is I uh, do a Doctor Who podcast If you want, with my wife, Shana. If you want to find that, it's at oispaceman.libson.com. That's oispaceman.libson.com. And... Um, that's probably if you're gonna do one thing, go listen to my Doctor Who podcasts because that's I'd just love to get a few more lessons on that. Yeah, so and you do. should because it's excellent. Thank you. Yeah, and um, <laughs> and Lee's, Lee Lee has listened to every episode so far as I yep, know. Yep. Um, and you can uh, you can find me. Uh, don't friend me on Facebook. Uh, I am I am Lee Russell. Uh, you can find me on <laughs> YouTube. Uh, just look for basically Hoagly Beer Reviews. H O U G L Y. Or you could uh, find me on Twitter. H O U G L Y Reviews. Uh, you can email me Hoagly Reviews at Gmail dot com if you hate this podcast or love it and want to send messages to me. Or if you hate Daniel, send messages to me and I'll relay them to him. Um, so yeah, uh, th- thank you very much, uh, everybody, for listening. And uh, as tradition, so far the ban hammer has not come down. So uh, although I can't monetize these things on YouTube, we we still are getting away with the music, and it is my turn to pick. And I think there is no better way to go out than Boyd's Journey from the soundtrack of Ravenous, which is incredibly awesome. So uh, thank you, Daniel, and thank you, everyone else. Good night. Thanks much for having me. Cheers. Yeah.